the Vox Markets podcast with Justin Waite. Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy anything based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research. Welcome to the podcast on Friday the 13th of November 2020. On the podcast day, Andrew Duxbury, finance director of Galliford Tri, provides an update beat trading statement that shows their cash position is towards the upper end of previous guidance. Also on the podcast, Paul Hill, full-time investor and equity analyst, talks about five stocks to follow, which are On Commune, Gallifer Tri, Equals, Telewimpian, On the Market. By the way, Gallifer Tri is up very strongly today on that statement. Uh, also, Russ Mould, Investment Director at Stockbroker AJ Bell, talks about growth versus value. And at the end of the podcast, as always, I'll have two lists for you. The top five most followed companies on Vox Markets in the last 24 hours and the top five most liked RNSs. By the way, you can see top 10 visions of both these lists at voxmarkets.co.uk. We'll all see lots of the content. In fact, you'll see that interview Paul Hill did with um, Dr. Adam Hill. No relation to Kunda Paul uh, from Onkimune. There's also one there in Alien Metals plus a COVID-19 index. Uh, what's the biggest rise of the day? It is Synergen, up 30% to 131. Biggest fall of the day is Modern Water, down 10% to 2.2. Check that out at voxmarkets.co.uk. Vox Markets is an online community of investors that runs a free mobile and desktop platform that allows you to track news and updates about any UK-listed company. Offering RNS push notifications, detailed charts, pricing data and much more. Find out more at voxmarkets.co.uk forward slash app. And joining me on the podcast right now is Andrew Duxbury, Finance Director at Galliford Tri. GFRD is a ticker there. Andrew, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you. It's great to talk to you again. Yeah, well, you just uh, announced a trading update. So that was alongside your AGM. And we'll you know, talk through some of the highlights of that update in a bit. Before we do, for people not familiar, I know you've changed or refocused the business uh, recently. So can you just explain what the business is about? Galliford Tri, please, Andrew. Yeah, of course. Well, Galliford Tri is a UK construction company having sold our house building businesses in January this year. And, and we're a well capitalized company. We've got cash on the balance sheet. No debt, no pension scheme liabilities. And, and Justin, construction is fundamental to the UK economy and to its post-COVID economic recovery. And we operate nationally through our building and infrastructure divisions. So in building, our order book covers education, defence, health, commercial sectors, and is really focused on improving the UK built environment. Mm-hmm. And in infrastructure, our clients are primarily the public and regulated sectors, and we split infrastructure between highways and environment, environment being mainly water and wastewater. Um, and, and I guess finally, our management team, very experienced and is really committed to creating long-term value for our stakeholders. Absolutely. Okay, so you just said the AGM, you've uh, released a trading update alongside that. Uh, give us some of the highlights, if you could, Andrew, of that. Sure. Well, we're four months into the financial year and trading has been very good. So all of our sites are open. Our projects are fully operational and productivity is at, is at normal levels, despite COVID and the second national lockdown that we're in. Uh, we've got excellent average month end cash. Uh, in the first half year, the cash is towards the upper end of our previously guided range, which was 125 to 145 million pounds. And we expect to return to profitability in the first half of this current financial year and to resume our dividend with the interim results. Uh, we're really encouraged by the order pipeline and by some excellent recent strategic contract wins. And all of that comes together means that we're making really good progress against our strategy. Excellent stuff. And, uh, tell us about the strategy, if you could. It, you know, it gives a bit of insight in, into that. Sure. Well, our strategy is really focused on robust risk management, sustainable growth, and that sustainability agenda is really important to us. Uh, it's about careful cash management, and it's about margin progression. So as part of that risk management we operate with carefully selected sectors, with, which is largely through frameworks and with repeat clients. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we're well capitalized. We've got no debt, no pension liability. We've got a portfolio of high quality PPP assets. And we've got a really strong order book, which is in our chosen markets and has got the right risk profile for us going forwards. So as I've said, we're making good progress on these strategic priorities, but just as importantly, also making really good progress against the financial targets for the business that we set out in September of this year, which are, as I said, focusing on bottom line 
margin improvement. Yeah, absolutely. And before we go, I ask you for three reasons why someone should add it to the watch list. I mean, uh, in the week, of course, there's very positive news on the on the vaccine, and uh, that must give a, a bit of a boost because there's many, so many sectors have been hammered down due to COVID and, and not trading at the true value. I mean, I, I think you know we are seeing some light at the end of the tunnel. That's got to have a positive effect on, on the company and your operations, hasn't it, Andrew? Yeah, absolutely. As I said, we stayed operating throughout the COVID. A pandemic, all of our sites are open, which is great, but we can't look past, you know, COVID you know, is a big disruptor for our clients, you know, for many of our suppliers as well. So the vaccine coming through, when that comes through, that will be you know, a real benefit to us, you know, as it is to the whole economy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think there's lots of news coming out on vaccines uh, over the next uh, few weeks. So, uh, yeah, hopefully more good news uh, for you guys and your clients. OK, Andrew, every day in the podcast, I highlight the top five most followed companies on Vox Markets in the last 24 hours. So to get on that list, of course, people have to hit that follow button on your page. So give us three reasons why someone should hit that follow button and add Galliford Try to their watch list, please. Yeah, of course. Well, look, firstly, it's our strong platform that we've got for sustainable, profitable growth. So we've got the right strategy. We're well capitalized, got great client relationships, great framework positions. And Justin, we're seeing the fruits of this already in our current trading performance. We'll be profitable this year. We'll be reinstating dividends this year. And we've got a really strong cash performance this year. So secondly, it's that focus on risk management, which gives us the confidence for the future. Our focus on sectors, which have got real growth potential, where we've got core proven strengths and a real disciplined approach to project selection. And thirdly, again, this is about the outlook. We've got a really high visibility of our future revenue streams, including the positive impact of the increased government investment in construction as part of the government's economic recovery plan. So, so three really strong, strong reasons why your listeners should follow us. Excellent stuff. Andrew, good to chat to you, and uh, hopefully we'll be catching up in the not-too-distant future. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks very much indeed, Justin. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waits. Welcome to Stocks to Follow. This is on the podcast and the video. Don't forget, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, hit that subscribe button and notification bell if you want to straight to inbox. Paul Hills with me, equity analyst, full-time investor. You're right, fella. Yeah, it's Friday the 13th, though, so watch out the, uh, for anything happening like black cats. Not only that, tech issues. We've had an hour and a half of tech issues. Uh, so that's taking us down. I'm assuming it's Friday the 13th. I, I think it's Zoom, to be honest. It, it conflicts with my system. But there we are. We, we're here. Uh, so uh, there we are. Let's start off then. Let's start off on a macro level. Big, massive news out this week on Pfizer and the vaccine, wasn't it? You know, Absolutely brilliant, yeah. I mean, it just it was a totally blockbuster. It was, I, I thought the sort of the efficiency rates of vaccines, we were both quite positive when they were coming through. We're going to be roughly around about 50 percent. And I remember having a good chat to you in terms of I didn't think if 50 percent effective, it would actually give us herd immunity because we were still going to have to have everybody inoculated every three or four months. But 90 percent is a game changer. And that's what the market actually responded to. And you saw that through the sentiment, your fear gauge, because it went from 22 last Friday. And I think it's about it's over double. That's over 50 now. Um, and yeah, we had a sort of like a bipolar response on the market. All the banged up sort of like, you know, trod, it did trodden down sort of COVID stocks from before. So your banks, your, your airlines, your cruise liners, all that kind of stuff soared. And then equally on the other side of the gauge, you had some of your big techs coming down. But I mean, I think you pointed out to me, your COVID testing stock's got a real hammer in. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, listen, Pfizer's the first to announce. So we've got Moderna coming out, same kind of technology. There is a distribution, uh, you know, there's a logistics of distrib- uh, distributing minus 80 degrees it has to be at. It's, it's, it's a hurdle, but it can be done. But I think the big game changer, but w- when we get Moderna, you know, figures out, I think it'll happen again. We'll see these beaten down stocks because we see the economy, you know, getting to open back up in six months time, maybe. So that's what we're seeing. I, I think it's a, a tide change. I really do. But I think the game changer after Moderna will be AstraZeneca because their vaccines can be stored at normal temperatures, pretty much um, two to eight degrees. And we bought, and the government's bought 100 million doses of that. And that's going to be, you know, date, sort of data on that coming out probably end of November, in December. But like I said, we'll have Moderna next. Again, I see a spike up in the stocks, written down, and then maybe set on down a bit. Then AstraZeneca, that's the game changer, I think, because that's where, you know, like I said, that's going to really change it for us all. But right now, I, I, I'm i going to do a video on the weekend called Should You Buy the Dip? And I said, you should buy the dip if basically, you, you know, it's in an uptrend. Now, I, d- I see now 
all these uh, like hospitality, leisure, banks, all that, they will start being an uptrend now. I think they'll be outperform anything else in the next six months, those stocks. And I think anything to do with COVID, that's relied on COVID, will pretty much take a dive every time we have vaccine news coming out. And so if you're holding those stocks, you know, put your tin hats on, I think, you know, absolutely. Yeah, I'm with you. I think well, one thing which is quite interesting, which I haven't heard talked about, is that 90% is so blockbusterly good, it's yeah. actually put a pretty high bar for all the other vaccines. Because if you were a government, let's just put it in perspective, and you were buying 100 million doses, yeah, would you want a, another vaccine that was, was only 50% effective and you're going to have to basically inoculate people three or four times a year? Or well, would you actually go for one with 90%? And, and the answer to that is you're going you're gonna to go with one, aren't you? Well, it, well, the economics may prove, it's a bit, first of all, like I said, distribution is going to be hard. You have to set a cold you know, supply chain with uh, Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines. Plus, they cost 30 quid a shot. AstraZeneca's? Two pounds a shot. So the government spent over a billion on 40 million doses of Pfizer's, and they'll spend a hundred, what, million on hundred, so 200 million on 100 doses and a million doses of AstraZeneca. So the cost is phenomenal. It's 10 times, Pfizer's is 10 times the cost of AstraZeneca's pretty much. Um, so uh, yeah, if it comes down to the cost, and also in developing worlds, you're going to have a problem with Pfizer and Moderna's because they have to be at minus 80, whereas AstraZeneca is fine. You know, it can be distributed around the world. So okay, AstraZeneca. Okay. Let's just take a step back. Okay, if you, were given, if you were a government and you were given the choice of getting herd immunity or not herd immune immunity, <laughs> it's an easy, it's an easy one because you. Yeah, but we don't know what the rate of AstraZeneca is yet. Right? Exactly. You know? So that's so, what, I've, what I've said. What I've said is ninety percent efficiency is quite a high bar. Oh yeah, for yeah, the, yeah, yeah. For the yeah, rest but, to come on, on to, which is great. Uh, let's be clear about it. It's absolutely. We both totally agree that the beaten down stocks have now got effectively a floor underneath them and should yeah. come back. Well, I mean, your your one was it a stable? Should do well. Load, I think load up on the banks, load up on travel stocks, all the good companies. Load up on them because I think honestly. The stock market looks 12 months down the line and it's seeing an open economy in 12 months' time, fully opened and reopened, as long as we get, if, you know, we get some more positive data from these uh, vaccines, which I think we will. Like, Moderna is the same tech as Pfizer, you know? Uh, and then AstraZeneca, th there have been good reports coming out about that as well. There's been one sort of health uh, safety issue, but the, the person that had the problem was had an underlying health uh, and safety issue. But, I mean... I just genuinely think 12 months will, will almost be, with the market, I think the market will rally strongly over the next six months uh, for those sectors. Uh, and, uh, of course, the economy will get back to normal by this time next year. But, of course, the market looks ahead, doesn't it? So um, Yeah, I think, I think the next three months might be a bit rocky because you're going to get sort of like negative GDP prints with the lockdowns in the UK. But I'm with you. As long as you have a longer time horizon and 12 months, you'll see some, I think you'll see some very good returns on those stocks it, it, that are still in fair market. Yeah, GDP, though, looks behind, isn't it? So people are, are assuming we know what's happened behind. Mm. It's just, can we get back to normal? I think that hope after this year's lockdown will be good. Anyway, let's look at um, stocks to follow. Uh, what you got there, Paul? Start off. What you got? I, I actually spoke to just yesterday, and the video is now on, so I'd, I'd, I'd certainly recommend investors have a look at it. I spoke to a guy called Dr. Adam Hill. He isn't any of my relatives at all, <laughs> but he's the CEO of Onkimune, and he was talking through his actual the actual business itself. And this is... You talked about the vaccine. It was a massive breakthrough. Well, there's another breakthrough which has happened in, over the last few years in medical science, and that is using your immune system to basically diagnose patients early of certain conditions, but also on personalised medicine. And now, just you probably the investors have probably heard about the term personalised medicine, getting treatment specifically to people, etc. Now, when it comes to sort of like diagnosing people, you know. It's, when you've got cancer or you've got other conditions, sometimes you only find the symptoms and it's far too late. You've got stage three cancer, for instance. Now, if you actually use your immune system, firstly, to use it as a biomarker, what I mean by a biomarker is basically like a, a, an early warning system that this patient has already got cancer, then you can, you can bring forward that diagnosis, bring it forward by four years, and what that means, using their, you know, their immunodiagnostic immuno technology, is that the treatment cost and the patient's outcomes, the, the actual beneficial, is just massively better. So instead of actually having a sort of like having to spend three hundred thousand dollars on a on a 
discreet drug, etc. You've treated them very early, and he's had a much better quality of life. So, the, this is why it's a huge immuno. Immuno anything is a bit like the internet back in in twenty in two thousand, and like this vaccine. It's a massive, massive game changer for the medical world because it allows personalised medicine, and it allows the early diagnosis of multiple conditions, whether it's oncology, which is cancer, or autoimmune, or infectious diseases like. COVID and and what you're using, the single most important thing the investors should go away is what you're using is your immune system to identify that individual, whether he has a particular condition, about you know multiple years earlier. Now just to give you just to give you numbers, this is a really, really hot area, not surprising for investors, because it really is breakthrough science. Now in oncology alone, the biggest one of the biggest players is is um, uh, Illumina, and it basically bought a company called uh, Grail um, a, a couple of a couple of months ago for eight billion dollars. It sizes the oncology immuno sector, the, the next next generation diagnosis, at seventy five billion dollars, and that just is one therapeutic area. So the reason why I alert investors to this is that this company has built a database of immuno diagnostic um, science that is just leading edge and, the, and therefore you can then use it to develop products and it's got one of its own which is a lead uh, early warning system for lung cancer but it's just using it's really using that it's to showcase its technology and it's going to then sell the data and the information it gets from its platform it's, it's, it's immuno diagnostic sort of like you know information bank to other uh, whether it's a drug discovery companies, whether it's other test developers uh, going forward, and they could—I go, mean, might, they're, they're worth about 110 billion. I'm sorry, 110 million pounds at the moment, at a share price of about 180. I could easily see them getting to well over a billion in in 10 years' time. That is, would not be a, a stretch. But given the, given their competitors have just been bought for two billion and for eight 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 billion. And if you just worked out what the platform is worth and just used a sort of like a modest peer group multiple of, 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 a, of a multiple of four of their R&D spend, you get to a, a, a fair value for the ship just for the platform, regardless of the test they have, of four pound, over £4.30 compared to eight, 180p. So the point here, yeah, the big picture is, is that they have got one of the, um, one of the only immunodiagnostic uh, data stores in the world that likes of Roche, Genentech, Novartis are actually going to to be able to leverage to develop their their diagnostics and to develop their drugs going forward. Um, so they've got they're in a, they're in a, a brilliant position. And even better, this thing is getting this is this thing is getting improving itself, enhancing as it goes on because they as when they do tests and take samples like biopsies from um, their clients. They then store that information. It adds to the database. It makes it bigger. It makes it deeper, and it gives the more beneficial data with AI on top for their clients and for the medical world. It's like it's it's it's, it's like one of those things. It just gets better and better, and, and somebody else is paying for it. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I would strongly recommend. I know you're you're chatting to Adam at some time going forward. Yeah, I've chatted to him a while back actually. I was very impressed with the system, but uh, it's one of the things I couldn't quite get my head around it. I think, I suppose, but um, you know, I hope, have I explained it to you? you yeah, yeah, yeah. You being part of the family, there, family being part of the family there, you should know a lot about it. You know, because um, <laughs> him being your brother, you should say because a couple of shares. But uh, on Kimi, O N C is ticket there, isn't it? So put that in your watch list, and it's been followed actually on, on thing. Do you know what? I want a quick, quick mention. I'm not going to go too much detail because they're on the podcast today. But Galliford Try, they've uh, you know refocused the business business in, in the construction. They're going to be profitable next year. And literally, their the market cap at the moment is below the net asset value. But um, like I said, they, they are doing well. They're sort sort of refocus it because they they sold off the home building part of it. Um, but yeah, but even with lockdown, they've been doing very well. And you should check out, they did a, a statement, AGM statement out today, and um, their cash levels are at the top end of where their guidance was. I always like that. And like I said, profitability next year. And literally, you can see they'd be hammered the share price, but they're now flatlining. But today, one of the biggest rises, I think people are starting to see that they're making progress here. Uh, like I said, with profits coming next year and a big cash pile, they're no debt. Uh, then I think people are understanding it a bit more. But Gallup and Try, worth looking at. Definitely. Well, one, just, just, on, just on that, my father 
made yeah. a shed load of money out of a Galloper try a few years back. So he's a real big fan. And you're right, as long as it, you know, with good management team, it's a beaten yeah. down stock. If you look at a three to five year period, then uh, you know you, you can do really well out of that. Yeah, well, they're in, just in construction now, and they've got some big chunky contracts. I mean, worth looking at, over their news of, of late because it's worth because uh, uh, chart wise, ideal is starting flat line, starting to pick up a little bit. Um, but um, it, it seems at the bottom has you know been touched, and we're bouncing off that now. So uh, have a look at it. Um, go on, what's the next one from you, Paul? Well, you and I both own it, Rosslyn Data Systems. Yeah. And they- Data technology. I mean, they they announced that they just won a large three-year contract with a UK grocer and a general merchant. Now I don't know who that is, but it, that was sort of like it was UK and Ireland based. So it's either Tesco's or M&S or somebody of that ilk. Um, and it's ba- it, what it, what effectively they've sold them is a is a point software solution that allows them to do all of the Brexit document documentation, so the customs calculating tariffs, collecting import-export duties, all seamlessly and automated. Um, and and the, the, the other advantage of it is that it allows you effectively a bridgehead into the account to give you, you know, to land and expand and to sell up the, you know, the big data and the AI technology, plus any future cost-saving um, software. So this is, it, it's, it's taken the shares up by about a pence, 1p this, year, this week from about uh, 5 5.25p to about 6.25p but it's just really a statement of intent I still think they're very cheap they're only trading on about two times sales compared to the sector on about five and um, you know they've got they've got I understand they've got the pipeline is good so it's a matter of sort of converting that and you know all I'd say is it's have another you know it's a great customer to have I have a fair value of, of 10p the shares are at, at, at 6.25 I've got a lot of shares there's no reason for me. Just I'm just going to carry on holding because I think they're going to do a great, do a great job. Well, sometimes obviously they can't say how much the contracts are worth, but I always get slightly annoyed when you see a contract with a big person and you can't have any idea how much it's worth. You know, any idea? What's your thoughts on that or not? Well, I, mean, I, I don't think I don't think it's material, as in like you know, to move the dial. But okay. the point the point is, it's another blue, it's a big blue chip customer who's yeah. using the, you know, and, and direction of travel, they aren't going to be the only, you know, sort of company who needs Brexit custom software. I mean, anybody in the UK is going to is going to want to automate it. And because of COVID, there's been other priorities. So you can see that part of the business doing really well. The, you know, the big data side from other, you know, from other channel checks from D4T4 is doing well. So that's I think that's that, that and obviously the, the cost reduction platform they have on the on the supply chain again that should be doing well also so I'm sure their pipeline is very ripe for plucking and to uh, you know convert into hard orders going forward. There's been a bit of an air pocket over the last six months as there has been across the whole B two B enterprise space because of COVID, but that's not lost. It's just deferred. The pent up demand. I think they're going to have a really good 2021, 2022, like most of the other software you know, stocks we talk about, because corporates haven't yet spent but still need to. They're in a perfect space, you know. Software it saves company, you know, sort of like um, time, resource, and cost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, RDT. That's the third one to follow. There, do some research. Uh, any others? Yeah, well, another one I own. You know, I don't know. You know, I own quite a few shares. Is Equals. Group, which is basically the old Fair FX, and they had a landmark contract with um, with Home Send today uh, this week earlier, um, which is a, which is ju- a majority owned, I, I believe, by Mastercard. So this is a real sort of like you know blue chip customer, and they're using Equals's uh, bank grade software and straight through processing um, technology to do their UK bank. Uh, transactions from their clients all the way around the world. Now, you know this is a, what they call a B two B to B deal. So effectively, they're set that they're selling it into Home Center. Are also effectively they're using it as their platform to do their back end, um, and that just shows you how one good the technology is, and two, if some of the biggest hitters of the operators in the world decide to, you know, um, standardize. On equals is uh, on equals is platform. Then they're still trading a ridiculously low valuation on what's sort the of one point four times sales compared to the market for fintech sort of payments. They're about four, five, six times. So again, I just think there's a lot of upside there. I mean, it's a, it's a, it, it's a first of hopefully a lot of deals onto this B two B to B side. But um, yeah, it's another flagship contract. 
EQ LS yeah, jumped up this week, didn't it? From uh, a couple of pens up there, it's nice. It's, uh, he's, had a of, he's had a couple of niggy sellers in the background who have just dumped stock onto the market. But once it's reached the base, and again, it should be a big beneficiary next year through pent up demand because you know as their customers start spending more and traveling more, and you have corporate, you know, because they've been hit as people haven't been able to go on foreign holidays, and also because you know business people haven't been able to stay in hotels and travel. But that will all come, a lot of that will come back next year. Um, and their 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 B two B customers, their corporate clients, will you know are, are, are growing in terms of using more and more you know digital payments. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, it's going to be. Uh, I do. You know, twenty twenty one. I'm quite bullish on you. Yeah? Uh, I've been saying that for the last two or three weeks. You know, I've I've had a rubbish twenty twenty, and I've written it off, even though it's had a good bounce this week. And I'm just going to put it down as one of those years that you just want to forget. But I'm really bullish on 2021 because mm. most of my stocks, I mean, not, I haven't got to buy anymore. I've done my, it's almost, my per, 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 portfolio is almost perfectly placed to benefit. So it might mm. not happen, but, you know, I'm very, very comfortable. Another one is um, which came out on Monday. And we've been talking about these for, for some time. The UK house builders, Taylor Wimpy. You know I own a, quite a few shares in them, particularly because they are, they build houses. Ninety percent of their portfolio is house building rather than flats, etc. So you've got that sort of like balance that moved and shift towards people wanting a bigger property for home working and also a garden. Um, and uh, and they came out surprise surprise with they're selling more properties at higher prices than they'd previously expected. So they had a big trading update Monday that they upgrade. They said they were they were gonna they were gonna hit the top end of their analyst expectations for this year, and then they were gonna be well above the top end of consensus for 2021. And and so the shares have rallied from about 110 to about 145, I think. But even on my modest expectations for next year, they're still only on. 1.3 times book, and the, that's less than the peers, about 1.4, 1.5. PE ratio is less than 11 times for next year, and they're going to pay a dividend, and they've got 500 million of cash on the balance sheet. I mean, it, I just don't think there's much downside, unless you believe the housing market's going to have a real problem next year, which I don't now, because we've got the you know the vaccine breakthrough, then mm -hmm. um, these guys should do well. It's not, it's, you're never going to 10 times your money on it. But hey, you know, there's some. I like you've got to have a port. I, I I like a portfolio where you've got some good multiple opportunities. I.e., such stocks like like um, Equals, like uh, um, Elicos, Elicosoft, and um, and, and Rosslyn, which can two, three, four times your your your, your you know your, your investments. But equally, I like some some stocks that can sort of go up fifty percent, even hundred percent over five years because. You know, they're big cap, there's more solid, more stable. And and, and um, Taylor Wimpy, in my view, falls into that cap. Yeah, well, you say that, more solid, more stable. I've seen some pretty volatile times amongst the big stocks. But having said that, you know, I think Taylor Wimpy and all that, they're stamp duty freeze, isn't it, until next March. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, but it'll be extended. I mean, there's no way the chance is going to... If it's not extended, I, I can't see the, 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 the market drop off a cliff. I think, if anything, people will try and rush and try and get it, you know, something yes. done. For it. it won't drop off a cliff afterwards because it, it'll just go back to normal if that's the case. But um, it may be extended, yeah. But they've got to get some money in the, in the coffers that the, the, the bank in there, or the, I mean, the government, they are in debt. They, they, they will, they will, but not so soon. They're just going to... Yeah. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you, you're not going to push us into a recession, but the housing market is just too important for the UK economy. To, to, to take your foot off the pedal at the moment. That's the that construction, which is your Galliford try, and the UK housing market employs so many people, not only directly, but more so indirectly. Mm -hmm. um, and so that I just cannot, I mean, and also the repair and maintenance industry and stuff off the back of it. It's just absolutely crucial. He's, he's an astute guy, the, the Chancellor, and he realizes that there's a few sectors which are strategic to the UK economy, and and housing market has a huge wealth effect because if your house is going down, you feel as though you're losing money, and therefore you you pull back your horns. If it's going up, you then think, okay, I'm actually going to spend a few because my house has gone up by a few thousand pounds. There's no way he's going to risk a, a, a second uh, recession on the back of taking um, taking the housing market down. I just can't see it. Be, it'd be stupid. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you know what? That's why. I mean, for housing uh, or that area, that's why I'm I'm investing on the market. You know, on the market. dot com. I just think, yeah. I just think it's ridiculous the comparison. Now. I mean, if you look at um, the amount of agencies they have committed, right move. Right move is ninety times the valuation, nine zero times the valuation of, on the market. They have about close to twenty thousand uh, agencies on their books. Right move. 
Uh, on the market, got over 14,000 now. All right? Their website traffic is going up. They did charge a third of right move. And they're 65% owned by estate agents. And they get, I'm, I've got, I can say exactly, two filters exactly set up for right move on the app and on the market. And they're now getting, I'm getting pretty much a similar uh, amount of, uh, you know, inquiry, probably sending me on a weekly basis. And I think that shows stock levels on the market is very good. And so I'm just thinking, there's no way, you know, there's no way they're worth nine times less than the right move at the moment. And uh, after a while, of course, they've got quite a few uh, agencies on reduced rates or free rates, but they're converting those people. And when they can show them, you know, that their leads you know, is very good and is, is worth a lot of money to them, they'll, they'll, I mean, it, most agencies, I think, will have, you know, two portals, you know, on the market. But then, of course, they're, they're, they're loyalty, agencies' loyalty is going to be towards on the market because they'll have shares in on the market. And they offer up these new and exclusives, often 24 hours ahead of Right Move. And I, I get them, I see them, but wow. And then on the mark, and then Right Move send me an email about 24 hours afterwards with the same property. So I'm thinking, wow, there's such a big gap between, you know, the valuation of Right Move and the valuation on the market. It's ridiculous. And uh, like I said, first time they made a profit um, last year. So it's, I think it's looking good. The metrics are stacking up. Everything's in the, in the right direction. Agencies signing up for them. Uh, and website traffic, everything is going in the right direction from the market. You know? Yeah, I think you've chosen well there. I mean, we've chatted about sort of on the market a few times, and uh, the one reason, only reason why I didn't, I, 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 I like the management team, I love the business opportunity, is that I have, a, I have exposure to the housing market through Alico and Alico Soft, and, and likewise with, uh, with Taylor Wimpy, and also with Lloyd's, and Lloyd's has got you know, the biggest mortgage book in the, so I have enough housing market exposure, but I think you're right. I mean, it's got a one way, it's going to, once you reach a critical mass, which is already done, it almost becomes the brand becomes self-fulfilling because it being it, you haven't got to advertise because it just becomes people like you start being the ambassador because you're customers and you're getting a great service. You start saying to your neighbour, your neighbour, actually, I'm you know I'm getting this and this and this, and so you know just virally they get lots of more customers. They haven't even got to advertise. And you had that with Aldi back in, in, in like 15 years ago when it sort of yeah. increased the market share because people used to sort of think. Actually, that's the best thing to go to. So you're going to get it on with with on the market. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and literally, the more people sign up to you, of course, as, as a user, the more email shots you send out. So of course, it generates a lot more website traffic. So yeah, it just builds. It's it's just a, you know a flywheel effect, isn't it? Anything else? No, no. I think that's probably it, really. I mean, as I say, there's been a good bounce. I'm re- I'm pretty positive about the actual you know the the year end, and uh, I think next year is going to be excellent. Um, yeah. Cool. There we are. Five stocks uh, to follow there. And don't forget, if you want this video to inbox, then hit that subscribe button and notification bell. Paul, speak next week. Yeah, thanks, Justin. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waits. And joining me on the podcast right now is Russ Mould, Investment Director at Stockbroker AJ Bell. You're up, Russ. I'm in good health and I'm in good form, I'm pleased to say, Justin, even though we currently have no kitchen during during English lockdown two, which is a masterpiece of bad timing. Yeah, yeah. Well, how are you doing? How are you dealing with it? Do I, I suppose, uh, you know, all these Uber Eats takeaways and all these kind no, of just eat? We, or what? We, we're determined not to go down that path and the grounds will be like a house end at the end of the, the, the five or six week period. So we're actually, we've actually got a little two ring hot plate. Mm. Uh, and I'm eating an awful lot of soup, ping, ping, at the moment. Um, we, the plan was to eat in our lovely local pub once or twice a week, which may not have been good for the girth, but good for the soul. Yeah. But again, we, we, we can't do that at the moment. So yeah. there's a, there's a, we've got a rule of one takeaway a week, and then there's a lot of soup and a little bit of ping. But actually, we're not doing too bad with pasta, omelettes. Uh, we actually managed to cook some some fish on a hot plate the other day, so we're, we're, it's it's not ideal. And the house is a bit dusty and a bit smelly, but the builders are doing a, a fantastic job, and they're doing their bit for Travis Perkins and Ferguson and Grafton and all the builders' merchant stocks that you can think of. So. Do you know what? Right there, uh, you've summarised that uh, um, as the economy right now. Building can happen, uh, but you can't go to pubs, and that's the way yeah. it is, isn't it? So that's a, I mean, you can see why that happens. But um, do you know what? Of the rivals, to talk on the business level. Uh, Uber Eats versus Just Eat. Now, I've got both apps. We, I, I very, very rarely put it like mm-hmm. you once a week, if, if that takeaway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, Uber Eats are a lot more aggressive in the marketing, and uh, they're they, literally they are. very clever. Every Thursday or mid or start of the week, they give you a you know ten percent off. A uh, little notification pops up, and I don't get that from Just Eat. So they're trying to grab market share as well. But I mean, it's working because we sort of take advantage of that ten percent off sometimes. And yep. so I, I never use Just Eat anymore. And I, in fact, I've hardly ever used it anyway. But uh, anyway, what are we chatting about today, Russ? 
Well, I just thought we'd talk a little bit about growth versus value. And I know yeah. they're not labels every likes, I hasten to add. Mm. Um, so we can come back to whether they're actually relevant or, or not as well. Um, but just, it, we always had the vaccine announcement from Pfizer with that uh, late phase three trial on Monday. And, and, and everybody said, oh, look, you've seen a big move out of tech and growth into cyclicals slash value. Yeah, um, rotation of the, so we, of the we, money, we can yeah. ass- assess whether growth and value are the right terms or not. But also, um, believe it or not, value started outperforming in July. Oh, did it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, and all right, there are lots of ways in which you can slice it, uh, but this is one way which an American colleague, a uh, former American colleague, I should say, who, who now runs his own money, said something that he was looking. I mean, a lot of us are familiar with the QQQ, the Invesco QQQ Trust in the US. It's used as a bit of a proxy for growth stocks. It basically follows as a basket through a, 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 sort of a tracker fund the biggest 100 stocks in the Nasdaq that are not financials. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it's the QQQ. It's huge. It's hundreds of billions of dollars of assets under administration. Yeah. And what he does, and he's tipped me onto it, and I've written a, a piece about for our customers about it, and he looks at that relative to the IWN ETF in America, which is the Russell 2000 value ETF. So it's not just small caps, yeah. but it's value small cap or factor value. So you've got big cap growth, NASDAQ 100 biggest, I get relative to the, the, the Russell 2000 value. And yeah, surprise, surprise, over the last 10 years, the QQQ has absolutely run over the IWN. And, and since the FANG index was launched in 2014, that performance has become even more pronounced. But if you divide the price of the QQQ by the price of the IWN, you know, if the line goes up, then the QQQ is doing better. The line goes down, the IWN is doing better. And since the middle of July... The yeah. IWN has been outperforming, and that has become more pronounced this month and certainly in the last week. Now, the question is, will this last? Because we've seen head fakes before mm-hmm. where tech has sort of stumbled a little bit and, and slash value has come through. Now, now Warren Buffett, by the way, hates the phrase growth and he hates the phrase value because he says all investing is about growth. Yeah, yeah. What he, he says is... You know, growth is probably slightly more self-evident. It's tech, it's secular growth, it's companies that can do well, probably fair, broadly, irrespective of the economic environment. Value, I think people would describe it as undervalued growth or growth that isn't immediately apparent right now. So, which we would view right now as cyclical growth, because let's face it, there hasn't been an awful lot of economic growth around for the last 10 years. It's been pretty sluggish, and we've had a very, very deep and nasty recession this year from which we're struggling to emerge even now. But then... If we do get any economic pickup, the growth that you will get bombed out cyclicals from losing money to making a profit, they will grow much more quickly than any growth stock you can think of. So that's why you may have seen that transition. It, 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 I think it, it's as simple as that. Is the market now thinking vaccine plus fiscal stimulus plus monetary stimulus plus slash quasi return to normal at some stage means that all of those stocks that have just been hammered in terms of operational financial performance and share price airlines aerospace stocks hotels leisure stocks pubs rest. if they do get you know it won't take a, a big upturn in business from big losses to become small losses and small losses to become profits that's exactly and then they will, what, yes. and, that, and, the, and that's it it's just pace of recovery it's yeah yeah, yeah. Market. does that make sense yeah but do you know what? i said on on i'm looking at a tweet i sent out on, on september 26th where t- i took on the whole weekend podcast with a couple of mates i do it with who invest as well and i said listen when because pfizer was guiding towards october for their first bit of news but then apparently it became political and they, they, they delayed it a bit longer i don't know but anyway i oh, said yeah there was yeah, that yeah. suggestion they'd le- they left it till after the yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I did tweet on the 26th of September. I said, when a vaccine is announced in October, hot COVID stocks will bomb and bombed out travel, leisure and hospitality stocks will boom. You and, are the man. And, and I think, and I've got it was a month out, because Pfizer's a month out, but this, Pfizer's just the first. Moderna's next, the same kind of tech. And the dis- I, distribution, I yeah. The trouble is, distribution isn't that good on these things, because minus 80, but AstraZeneca, <laughs> now that's going to come up for the end of the year. That doesn't need to be refrigerated. And so, yeah. and that's, and we've bought a lot more stocks, but I think generally that will, bring the economy this light at the end of the tunnel these like, sectors that are bombed out of course like you said they don't need a lot to recover because some of them yep. like I said the pubs not taking any revenue in so they start recovering and uh, so you, you saw that I, I'm calling it Pfizer vaccine day on Monday if you look at the stocks that really rocketed on that day it'll be more of that when more news on co- vaccines come out like the, you know you've got easy jets and two E's yep. and all these 
carnival cruises, anything to do with leisure travel, they all sort of rallied. That to me is a tide, change in tide right there. It'll happen yeah. again and again. The that, more that's news my we get. suspicion. Yeah. And I think there's a temptation to think, oh, certain stocks are up 30, 40, 50, 60 percent. Mm. But that's only after one announcement. There yeah. are going to be more vaccine yeah. announcements. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's the issue. It, yeah, OK, th- there are clear obstacles. Yeah. It was a small trial that gave the 90 percent result. Mm. The thing's got to be frozen. It's got to be distributed. You know, there are 7 billion people in the world. You know, there are yeah, huge yeah. Th- things still to be overcome. But it's this, it's the rate of change in the rate of change. It's the second derivative. And once things stop getting worse and start getting better, mm. then you will see different shares performing and stock markets performing in a different way. Plus, you've still got huge amounts of fiscal support, huge amounts of monetary support. And I don't think they're going to be going away. Yeah. So I think, you know, and, and, and I was listening to a, a very intriguing webinar yesterday where one of the speakers pointed out that American disposable income was up 7.7% year on year last month. Wow. Now, at the moment, they're not able to necessarily get out and spend that to their full capacity because they're either, you know, they're either poorly, you know, fingers crossed they're better, or there's a local lockdown, or right, they're spending some of it online. But so what happens when those people are back out and about and they're back healthy and confidence is up and, and there's still a, a Democrat stimulus bill coming through? You, know, you would think at some stage there is going to be quite a lot of pent-up consumer activity. And it's the same in the UK. Those people who have been lucky enough to keep their jobs, and, and thankfully it's still the majority, or, or, uh, uh, then you know they're not going to be commuting. They're going to be better, a little bit better off. You have some more cash in the pocket, and hopefully people on furlough will be able to go back to where they started. There is potentially, again, quite a bit of pent-up demand out there. Mm-hmm. And that, I think, could still be seriously underestimated. Now, that could all, if we end up with a... You know, a, a third, fourth, wave, whatever. Oh, there's a big delay with the vaccines. Then clearly, there are, there are multiple things that can, that can still go wrong. But we're used. There's an awful lot of bad news in the prices. And things like airlines are basically being priced like options now, right? Yeah. I mean, either they go bust, mm-hmm. or or they're nationalised and the equity goes to zero, or they're going to quintuple. I mean, it, it, it. But it is that binary, and a lot of investors, understandably won't want to get involved in that risk reward scenario and, and, and it's only for a particular type of investor. But it is intriguing that even without getting involved in those binary situations, things like house builders that were trading at 0.6, 0.7 times book value, banks that were trading at 0.6, 0.7 times book value, they were good runners this week. And although banks have got their long-term challenges, at least their valuations are, are reflecting that. And again, if there's any whiff of a recovery, then you would expect, you know, those stocks are at least have a bit of a run. And I think things like house builders and there's huge amounts of government support there, again, potentially intriguing. And the, the ledger sites, uh, people are still worried about will it be around. If there's any sense that they will still be around, then they are potentially very, very cheap stocks. It's all with Whitbread as well. Mm-hmm. It's, it's got enough cash in its balance sheet to withstand, I think, 18 months of no revenue at all. Yeah. So, again, you know, you're going to have to be brave and patient. You'll be lumps and bumps. But it's intriguing that you've seen this turn since July. And I think the more news on vaccines we get, the more creeping confidence we get. I think the more people will lean towards cyclicals. This isn't to say that tech's going to go through the floor necessarily. No, but also yeah. if you then get the inflation angle on top, I think just the rate of growth, profit recovery you'll get in value will, will outstrip anything you can get from Amazon. And one's a heck of a lot cheaper than other on yeah, sales, yeah. book, earnings, whatever it is. So why pay huge multiples for secular growth when you can find much faster cyclical growth in the in the street for pennies. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, people understand the stock market, you know, you look at forward revenue and earnings, it's, it's looking ahead. So, you know, we get more uh, news on vaccines. And AstraZeneca is the big one. Moderna's next, I think, the same, very same tech as Pfizer. But AstraZeneca, we've, the government has brought 100 million doses of that compared to 40 million of uh, Pfizer. And, stuff, and it's, it, yeah. it can be distributed. And I think, you know, you've got to look 12 months down the line and say, OK, where are we going to be 12 months down the line? Because yeah. right now, are you going to get a discount right now? If you buy right now, it, it, I, I can't see the share prices of these companies being lower in 12 months' time. <laughs> you know, as simple as that. Not barring some disastrous setback no. with the vaccines. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. exactly. No. And, and I think ultimately, by seeing that there won't be a vaccine or that we, you know, we, we, we won't get through, it, it's betting against human ingenuity. And I don't think that's a good that, place yeah. to be. Oh, no, never, ever do I that. I don't that's think that's a good place. Mm-hmm. Looking at the record of the last... Millennia, I don't think that's a good place to be in the long run. <laughs> exactly, I know. Uh, Marvellous stuff, Russ. Have a nice weekend, fella. Keep well. OK, it's time for the top five most followed companies on Vox Markets in the last 24 hours. They are at five. Alien Metals, down 3.5% to 1.357. Uh, sorry, 1.375. At four, 
BPC, Palmas Petroleum, uh, up 0.7% to 3.4. At 3, Gallifer Tri, up 25% to 102. Of course, Andrew's in the podcast day. At 2, Synergen, up 30% to 131. And biggest rise, sorry, most followed company, which is a big rise as well, up 40% to 4.2 is Remote Monitored Systems, RMS ticker. All right, top five most liked RMSs are as follows. At five, Wishbone Gold, Haverian Telfer Project Acquisition Completed TVR. At four, uh, Iconic Labs, Placing and Financing Update. At three, Ama Minerals, Notice of Annual General Meeting. At two, N Condesi Energy uh, Project Update Early Works. And at one, Omega Diagnostics. Uh, their statement there about the UK RTC statement. Uh, but the company is down today, uh, 3% of 46.5 pence. That's it for the podcast. Thanks for listening. Much just appreciate. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waite. Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy anything based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research.